Good afternoon and welcome to the third of a four panel series on the uh, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. I welcome, I welcome both our audience that's listening and the audience here at the Heart Research Institute at, at Texas A&M uh, University Corpus Christi uh, to uh, this third panel. The uh, uh, panel is hosted by the Heart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies at A&M Corpus Christi and KEDT. I'm Dr. Larry McKinney, the Executive Director of HRI, and I will be acting as a moderator. I want to thank uh, the management and staff of KDT for uh, helping put this together. It's their idea. I think it's a great uh, way to get information out to our community. I appreciate their support. The university has also generous, generously arranged to uh, stream this live over the internet. If you go to Heart Research Institute, that's one word, heartresearchinstitute.org, uh, to the website and, and click on the uh, Osfield icon, you can go to how you can access this being streamed live uh, in uh, video and audio. There will be one additional panel following this one. Uh, that will be next Friday, June 25th, also at, at 3.30. Uh, if our listening audience has a question, you can email those questions to us at questions, with an S, questions at kedt.org. Please include a first name and location uh, with that information. Uh, before we start, I had a, a special announcement. One of the areas that we have not been covering in our panel is uh, human health uh, impact. Uh, and uh, uh, we have got some information I wanted to pass along to our audience. This is, this is from the Institute of Medicine for the National Academies. Uh, they will be holding a, a special uh, workshop in New Orleans, uh, June 22nd to June 23rd. So it would be a great trip to go to New Orleans if you can. But if you can't make that and you have that interest in human health impacts, they are also streaming that, that meeting uh, live. And you can go to www.iom.edu forward slash oil spill health, one word. That's I-O-M. Uh, edu forward slash oil spill health uh, one word if you're interested if you're interested in human health aspects of this bill and we're trying to get some some experts for our next and final panel to also talk about that uh, as well so let's get started today uh, two uh, important aspects of the oil spill have certainly received uh, attention this week uh, there are, have been some new estimates out it seems like every week we've had our panel there's been a new uh, estimate and the estimate has moved upwards uh, and now uh, they're talking about that it may be as much as 60,000 barrels per day uh, coming out of, out of the spill. I want to do a little bit of a soapbox uh, type thing, an editorial here. Uh, some time ago, and this is regards to one of uh, our colleagues here at the university, who's now at Florida State University, Dr. Ian McDonald. A number of weeks ago, back when the flow uh, was still being said to be around 5,000 barrels, uh, Dr. McDonald, who's an expert on, on looking at natural oil seeps and using satellite data to judge uh, the size of those seeps, he came out with a projection. He thought it looked like the spill was around 70,000 barrels per day. Uh, and he was very quickly uh, uh, attacked, I think is the word, and, and, and hit by, by British Petroleum and other uh, organizations that this was, uh, was outlandish. He shouldn't have done this. And, and I happened to be at a meeting on the oil spill with him in Mobile the next day. And he was taking it well, but clearly you know, it, had, it had bothered him. I just hope that these same organizations have been as quick uh, to uh, contact him and, and to apologize so the fact that he was, by orders of magnitude, unfortunately, much closer to the real spill. So what does that really mean for us? Uh, and it has, it has uh, significant meanings both from a biological response uh, situation and also looking at the damages of the spill. If you assume that uh, the 60,000 barrels per day flow has been going for some time, or for, since, uh, and this is day 60, basically what we've been seeing is the, an equivalent of an Exxon Valdez hitting the Gulf every five to eight days. And I sat down and did some very simple calculations last night looking at that flow rate and considering the fact that the cap that we see in, in the pictures on, on the internet is capturing uh, some of that flow, at least 20,000 barrels. But with all that in place, uh, if nothing else changes, uh, by uh, July 1st, uh, this spill will become the largest accidental spill uh, on record. Uh, and that's not a record that anyone would want to achieve, but it certainly is it's an important notice. And it's no coincidence today that uh, two of our panel members are experts on the world's largest oil spills. First, Dr. Wes Tunnell, who is the HRI Associate Director, <laughs> an expert on Ixtoc. Uh, and of course, the, the Ixtoc spill uh, is the current, and unfortunately, perhaps for just a short while longer, the largest accidental spill on record it occurred in 1979 and spilled some 140 million barrels of oil into the southern Gulf of Mexico. Also with us is Dr. Uh, Sylvia Earle, world famous uh, ocean explorer and most important to me she's chair of my uh, advisory council uh, and at that time she was the chief scientist for NOAA during the largest wartime uh, release of an intentional spill the 1991 Arabian Gulf Kuwait release which uh, released some 380 uh, 
million to 520 million uh, gallons of, of oil uh, into the to the sea. So we're, we're going to hear from them in just a few moments. But another topic that has received a lot of attention, and certainly is of great importance as a biologist, it has been the incredible and the massive use of dispersants, both at the surface and subsurface of the sea. Great deal of controversy about them. Are they doing their job? How do they work? And this type of thing. And, and so we're very, very fortunate to also have a leading expert on dispersants, Dr. Marion Nipper, who is the senior, a senior scientist, research scientist at the Center for Coastal Studies here at TMUCC. Now I'm going to introduce uh, each of the speakers uh, uh, shortly. They're going to give us a short presentation, overview of, of a thing that they're interested in in, in these various areas. Uh, but then we want to open it up for questions as we go. Well, we're going to start with Dr. Nipper, and let me introduce her more, more formally. Uh, Dr. Nipper uh, developed an interest in the effects of oil spills on marine organisms as a result of a spill of the tanker called the Brazilian Marina on the coast of her native state, Sao Paulo, Brazil, in 1978. She started studying the effects of oil hydrocarbons on marine invertebrates for her PhD dissertation in the 80s and never really lost interest in that subject. In the 80s and 90s, she worked um, on the assessment of toxicity of dispersants and oil dispersant mixtures to marine organisms. She has analyzed analytical effects of chronic oil contamination near oil terminals, toxicity of seawater under oil slicks caused by a variety of spills, and was part of the team that helped define appropriate conditions for the use of dispersants in Brazil. She currently works with contaminated marine sediments as well as toxicity of contaminants in coral reef environments. So I can't think of anyone better qualified uh, to talk to us about dispersion. So Dr. Nipper, please, at this time, if you could give us your opening remarks. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. So I've been given the task of discussing the toxicological aspects of the deep water, water horizon of low level. And the question here is, how does it affect marine organisms? I'm not talking about human exposure, the human dealing with the oil spill. I'm talking about the environmental effects in the marine, to the marine organisms. Well, it seems obvious. We're all devastated with the images we see of oil birds, of sharks struggling near the surface of oil covered water, uh, the news of oil covered turtles and dolphins washing ashore. However, there's more, much more than what meets the eye. Um, what we see is the physical effect of oil smothering the coastline, marine animals and plants being covered by the oil. Beyond that, however, oil has chemical toxicity. It contains chemicals that are toxic to animals and plants in general, while the oil is still offshore on the water surface and in the water column. And that's what I would like to address in a little bit more detail. Crude oil contains hundreds or maybe thousands of different chemicals. Every oil is different depending on its source. But all crude oils contain organic chemicals that are, to a certain extent, soluble in water. Um, and they also contain some inorganic chemicals, some metals uh, such as nickel, vanadium, copper, lead, even some mercury. I am not going to dwell on those, so those are persistent chemicals. They are a minor component of oil. Um, the organic chemicals, however, as they dissolve in the water column, they can affect the organisms under the oil slick or in those deep water oil clouds or plumes that have been identified and described. Oil components, these oil components we're talking about, they act on animals particularly through a narcotic effect. Narcosis will promote behavioral changes, respiratory effects, and eventually death if the exposure is prolonged. In this particular oil spill, there is also methane gas. The information I have that I read in the literature is that methane occurs in unusually high quantities in this particular well, in this particular oil, in the deep sea plumes and clouds. Possibly as a result of this methane, oxygen concentrations are dropping drastically in these deep water plumes or clouds to levels that are approaching what would characterize them as bad zones. Even before reaching the level of a so-called dead zone, however, uh, as if the oxygen depletion or the oil and the dispersants weren't bad enough, they may enhance each other's effects by, as adding, by, acting, me, by acting as concurrent stressors on marine organisms. And the ramifications of these are many and are not yet clearly understood. 
I would like to talk a little bit about dispersants using this oil well blowout. Dispersants break a fresh oil slick or mass into small droplets. This is what they're designed to do. So why is it advantageous to break, to break this fresh oil slick or the oil mass into small droplets? Because the smaller oil droplets are more available to bacterial attack and therefore to degradation. However, they're also more available to the marine organisms beyond bacteria, organisms in general, thus increasing the toxic effect of the oil. Uh, these persons are designed to be highly effective, meaning to break a large amount of the oil into small droplets. They are also designed to have low toxicity. However, low toxicity is relative. Um, the use of dispersants is recommended offshore on the fresh oil slip to prevent it from reaching the coastline where the physical damage is usually bigger, as you can observe in all the footage we see of the wetlands and marshes being affected in the coast of Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, and North Florida. However, the recommendation for the use of dispersant offshore on surface is for surface slicks in finite spells. For instance, if we have a shipwreck with a certain amount of oil, we know the amount of oil is in a, in a wreck that can leak from a wreck. If it's not feasible to contain that oil, dispersants offshore and deep areas are recommended, so it will prevent the bigger damage on the coast. However, a situation like the current one with continuous use of dispersants in such vast amounts is unusual. And the use of dispersants at depth is a new approach. We don't really fully understand the environmental effects of that. We do know that the water surface is a biologically rich environment. Many organisms, as well as their eggs, for instance, fish eggs or coral eggs, uh, float in association with the sea surface microlayer. This importance of keeping the oil from reaching the surface and creating a slide. Is However, despite the use of vast amounts of dispersant in the surface and depth, the oil slick has reached the water surface. It has reached the coast. At this stage, I'm not able to say if the dispersant is some good or there's more harm. I'm not going to venture to give an answer to that. I can speculate a bit on it later with any questions, but the jury is still out of that. I'm just going to go back with my final statement here to Paracelsus an alchemist from the 16th century. And Paracelsus said that poison isn't everything. The dose makes the poison. That's the actual basis of modern toxicology. Aquatic toxicity is the result of two factors, two primary factors, dose or concentration of chemicals that can be toxic in water and exposure time. In the corn oil spill, we have massive amounts of both, oil and dispersants. It's been ongoing for nearly two months now. Therefore, in terms of toxicology and environmental effects, we have high concentrations and long exposure time, which means that we're facing an environmental disaster of major proportions. And it's that of Thank you. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, and this is you know, one of the goals of our, our panels is there's lots of information that we're hearing uh, coming out just seem to coming out from all all angles uh, on this bill. But I think more people now know about the Gulf of Mexico than perhaps ever before. That's the good part. We know about loop currents and all kinds of things that no one else, no one knew about for many years. I think that's the positive side of, of this type of thing. But our goal is, and I think you heard an excellent presentation here, is to, to take some of that, some of those things that you're hearing about and, and trying to get you the best information available uh, so that you can understand it as well as we can. I learned a lot from that presentation. One of the things that, uh, one of the areas that has certainly come to the front this week has been this methane issue. Uh, there's been a report out by doc, uh, Dr. John Kessler, a colleague from Texas A&M University, about the methane uh, content and, and looking at some concerns about that because it's huge <coughs> quantities of methane. About 40% of this oil, oil release is methane, whereas normal crude may be 5 to 10%, something like that. So this is unusual in that regard. Of course, it's going into the water column, and there's great concern about it. Another uh, scientist, um, uh, Dr. Samantha Joy out of uh, Georgia, who has been uh, uh, tracking, actually out of the water, tracking some of these underwater clouds or plumes. There's a debate whether we should call them a plume or a cloud, or whatever. But one of the clouds uh, that she has characterized uh, was uh, about uh, covered about the area of this, what I would call the area of the city of San Francisco, and about 600 feet th thick and around 3,000 feet deep. Within that uh, that cloud, 
that she found concentrations of methane 10,000 times greater than normal. Uh, and so as you heard from Dr. Nepper, the combination of dispersants, oils, and <coughs> methanes uh, it can be quite a, could be quite a, a, a deadly mix. We just don't know, and that's a big issue. We have very little information. We're learning this now as we go, and that's, uh, that's disconcerting to, uh, to everyone trying to address this bill and, and otherwise, but it's a, it's a big issue. Um, so now uh, we want to move and talk, to, uh, have our next uh, speaker, that's uh, Dr. Wes Tunnell, who's the Associate Director of the Heart Research Institute. He's a marine biologist with a career-long interest in ecological impact of oil spills. He helped develop the National Spill Control School at a and in Corpus Christi and taught about the environmental impacts of spills for the last 20 years. He ex has experience in Ixtoc 1, a spill on Texas beaches and Mexican coral reefs, uh, and the re removal ballasting of impacts on reefs of ships in the Persian Gulf. He's looked at the impacts of the uh, burger, uh, the bird uh, banker <coughs> spill on Padre Island and has used and the use of burning as a cleanup technique uh, in the Exxon pipeline spill in Copano Bay area. Uh, and so he, he's a tremendous expert on this area. In fact, I would say literally, uh, we didn't know if he's gonna make this panel because he's been in Mexico looking back to see the, uh, look at the impacts of, of Ixtoc and so he's going to give us a first-hand report. So, uh, uh, Wayne Stardis, Wayne, uh, uh, Wes, uh, glad you're, you're back with us, and uh, please. Um, I'm sure I can say I'm glad to be back. <laughs> it was nice there. But since I'm from the place uh, they asked me to come to the historical aspects. Uh, <laughs> the uh, Emex is a Mexican government uh, national oil spill company, and they were the ones in charge of the Exxon spill. And, uh, June 3rd of 1979 when it blew out and it blew for almost 10 months to the 23rd of March 1980. Uh, it was uh, the largest spill in peacetime history as uh, Larry mentioned a while ago. I had the opportunity to become the uh, local scientific uh, coordinator with NOAA during that spill because I uh, knew the habitats in this area and knew the people in the area. So I, kind of became their assistant, so it was a, quite a learning experience in the process. Uh, some of the other people in the room here uh, were part of that experience also. Uh, I studied the Texas beaches with the opportunity of knowing the currents uh, when it blew out that it would be to Texas within about two months, and sure enough, it showed up in Texas, and it gave us time, though, to study, uh, run transects on Padre Island National Seashore before the oil got here, and then studied again after it got here. We saw reductions in 80% in the intertidal zone and 50% in the subtidal zone of the in fauna, the small organisms that live in the sand on the beach. I also had been studying the Mexican reefs around Veracruz since the early 70s and sent a group of graduate students down since I was busy up here to check on that. They took a lot of photographs <coughs> and information on it and I was teaching a class there this year. So each year when we return for the next couple of decades, we track that to watch what happened to it uh, as the oil came into that area. Then I also, through travel with other places and just work in general in Mexico, visited about 10 or 12 different over the last 30 years. So it gave a good opportunity to see these and how they changed over time. Uh, there is a lot of people who want to do comparisons between these bills, and I think it is more important to compare these and say the Exxon Valdez that was done early on. Uh, most people now have kind of backed off of that. That was a cold water spill in a different area in different circumstances. I mentioned just a few uh, examples here for comparison and similarities and differences. They obviously are both in the Gulf of Mexico, but the current spill is in the northeast in a warm temperate area. It's also, of course, in deep water. The East Stock spill is in the southeastern Gulf of Mexico about the same distance offshore, about 50 miles each of those, but the southern Gulf of Mexico is tropical rather than warm tempered. Both of these were a blowout, and the blowout preventer was a problem in both cases. Both of them had uh, fire associated with the immediate blowout. Uh, techniques were similar that were used to close these down in the early times. The jump shot that we all learned about it wasn't called that back during the Eastock time, but when they used uh, plates of uh, rubber and golf balls this time, they used steel shot that time to try to stop it. They created a cap back then to put over to try to corral the oil. In fact, it was called a sombrero because it looked like a Mexican hat that they put over it. The first one didn't work, but the second one worked fairly well, not completely. 
and corralling a lot of the oil. They had to drill two relief wells like we're doing today. Two relief wells were in process. The first relief well, Peak Stop 1, was to blow out. Peak Stop 1A uh, stopped the majority of the flow in December of 79. And then Peak Stop 1B stopped the oil completely when it reached the area and infused it with mud in March of 1980. The uh, uh, sandy beaches were impacted in both places, uh, all around the southern Gulf and western Gulf. Uh, the beaches of Miami, uh, excuse me, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida are being impacted and probably be more impacted. It's a similarity. The differences are we're talking about the salt marshes of the Mississippi Delta in the case of the current spill, and it was mangroves and coral reefs in the East Ox spill, again, more tropical kinds of environments. My uh, hope for one of the differences out of this one as I closed is that we can learn more over a long period of time scientifically through research about what happens in these major spills. That's uh, one of the key elements that we found out and many people want to know how we can compare and what did we learn last time. And unfortunately, both the U.S. and Mexico stopped the funding for long-term studies after the spill was over. And that's a pretty typical thing around the world for major oil spills. Once they're stopped, they're cleaned up. The research stops, and so we don't have a lot of the long term answers we'd like to have. Hopefully, we will have that out of this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wes. Um, as we uh, look at other impact and issues coming out of the, of the spill this week, uh, there have been uh, reports. We've seen lots of and <coughs> really uh, uh, horrific uh, uh, pictures and graphics of the impacts on the wetlands and the birds and those type of things you know, along the Louisiana coast. Uh, but we're also beginning to hear more now about the impact of those those organisms offshore. The first report of a, a sperm whale that has died uh, in, in in the area of spill, not knowing that's directly related to it, but I can't imagine that it's not in that in that area. And of course, tuna and other fish and those types of things, sea turtles a, as well. The point being that that there's a whole ecosystem out there that's all linked and it's all being affected. And I could not think of anyone better uh, to talk about. Uh, the oceans on that scale and has the experience worldwide. As I said earlier, Dr. Earl uh, was the chief scientist during the largest uh, release of oil anywhere uh, in the world uh, to date. Of course, we hope we never see that again. But in, by introduction, let me just say that um, she, probably, she really doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, she, uh, Dr. Earl is a world-renowned marine biologist. She's an ocean explorer, author, and a lecturer. And as I said earlier, most importantly to me, she's chair of my advisory committee. Throughout her career, she's logged more than 6,000 hours underwater, just about every type of submersible that, that has been built. Uh, she was the first woman to serve as NOAA's chief scientist and is now the explorer in residence at the National Geographic Society. Uh, as the uh, uh, most well-known speaker for OCEAN, she's not only inspired the creation of our institute here, but millions of people to take up the cause of the oceans. As that, in that chief scientist role, she was very closely involved both in the Exxon Valdez spill response and in the environmental impacts of the Persian Gulf oil fields. She inspected the burning oil fields and with NOAA and uh, Navy officials observed and documented the extent of the spill along the coast of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Sylvia led three NOAA follow-up visits uh, with oil spill experts, including diving in the Abu Ali area and the offshore islands to evaluate the extent of the impact. So at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Earl to uh, share her uh, thoughts and views on the current situation. Thank you. Well, it's not good news, in case you all know that. Like many of you, I fell in love with the Gulf of Mexico as a little kid on the west coast of Florida. I spent years as a scientist studying the Gulf of Mexico and, and still do. This place somehow has a way of wrapping itself around your heart, as well as your head, and mine anyway. And it is just tragic to be a witness to what is happening right now. And as Wes has pointed out, this is not the first time that there has been a major spill, a major blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. And what have we learned? I have to say, not much. <laughs> not much. And yet, this is an opportunity to not let that happen again, to take advantage, if you will, of this tragedy and find a bright mining. One thing that is clear as a consequence of the attention now being given 
to the Gulf of Mexico is that we neglected the ocean here and around the world. When you think about the technology alone, think about the aircraft that in the last 50 years have taken us to the moon and beyond that have managed to give us so much valuable insight into who we are, or where we're going, or where we've been. Think about the ships, fleets of ships on the surface of the ocean, but in the struggle right now to try to find something that will enable us, a real live human being, to go down to the site of where <coughs> the war is taking place. The number of vehicles available, you can basically count on one hand, and most of them are not in this country. And Japan has one, Russia has two, France has one. Actually, in the next few months, China will launch a deep sub, deeper than any of the others. The United States has fallen behind with respect to having people actually down in the sea. Now, lots of robots, lots and lots of robots, most of them developed and used by, guess what? The offshore oil and <coughs> gas industry. It's served them well. And so have modifications on the idea of remotely operated systems and autonomous underwater systems. They're serving science well. But still, think about what we don't know of the ocean, how much more we need to do to balance it out. Our view from high in the sky and at the surface, the average depth of the ocean is two and a half miles. The deepest part of the Gulf is what, West Tunnel? It's 15,000 feet? Do we know exactly? We, we've been trying to figure out, get the numbers that everybody can agree on. It's the Gulf of Mexico. It's our backyard. The, the magnitude of ignorance about what is actually there is now beginning to dawn on us as we struggle to weigh the impacts of this catastrophe. On one hand, you can look at the offshore oil and gas industry with a sense of great respect and awe that they are able to do what they do to find, to drill, to recover the energy sources that drive our civilization. And we have become really dependent on these sources of energy. Such sources have taken us to the moon. Fossil fuels, they've given us insight. They try to enable us to live the quality of life, not just in this country, but around the world. It used to be whale oil and seal oil that gave us light and heat. Fortunately for the whales and seals, their alternative methods developed. Maybe now, we will find alternative methods for fossil fuels. And they do exist. It's a matter of making them a priority. Really making them a priority. Not just a, something that we say, well, it's nice someday, or possibly it's too expensive. But doesn't that make you look right now and say, what's expensive? The loss of the Gulf of Mexico, the livelihoods of the people who are dependent on a healthy ocean? You know what? That's just about all of us. It isn't just the fishermen or the hotel owners. We are now, I hope, for the first time, perhaps, in a much more heightened sense of awareness understanding how valuable a healthy ocean is to every one of us. It isn't just what we can take out of the ocean or what we can put into it. The ocean really governs the way the world works. The spill in the Gulf right now is like a big two by four, making us aware of the impact of the, of the dispersants, the impact of the oil, the impact of years of of what we've been doing to the Gulf through what we've taken out and, and put into it in terms of, of decline of the sources of oxygen, the major systems that drive the way the world works. So maybe this is the moment to not just restore the livelihoods of people around the Gulf who are affected by this, but to restore the Gulf itself and to think like an ocean, to think what we can give back to the Gulf perhaps a network of protected areas that will give the ocean a great a chance to recover once we've found a way. I trust it will happen someday. Figure <coughs> out how to stop the oil and then take the steps necessary to cause the ocean to recover. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. O.
now is your chance, uh, both here in the, in the audience and on uh, listening on the radio on the web, to ask your question uh, of this panel of experts. Uh, if you're in the audience, you just come up here to this microphone, and I'll, I'll get to you. We already have a series of, of questions. Uh, again, uh, if you're uh, on email access, you can get your question to us at questions, with an S, uh, at kedt.org. <coughs> Uh, I've got one question here right now, and I, this one I think is clearly for Dr. Nepper. And the question is, what, which is worse? Is, is it the oil or the dispersant, and are they, are they any worse in combination? So that's the, that's the question of you, Dr. Nepper. Okay, the answer is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> Dr. Nepper is the consummate scientist. <laughs> Very non-committal. No, no, no. That, that, that is true. It depends on the dispersant. It depends on the oil. As I said, there are several different kinds of oil. Um, the lighter oils, meaning that they have a larger amount of the chemicals, of the organic chemicals, the smaller molecules, and more soluble as well as more volatile, but more soluble as well, tend to be more toxic than a heavier oil. I understand from what I've been reading, although, the, although most of the Louisiana oils are, crude oils are lighter, this is a heavier thickier nature, that's the word I read. So in terms of toxicity, the oil alone, toxicity in the water column as it dissolves, may be less toxic than the dispersant. Uh, dispersant is a rule of thumb, from what again, my experience by what I read, can to be more toxic than oil. The combination, you are adding two toxic chemicals, so it's in, most circumstances increases toxicity as well. Although that depends on the oil, depends on the dispersion, on the efficacy of the uh, efficiency of the dispersion. The variety of factors to be considered. Thank, thank you for that, that question. And Dr. Earl, you have a some comment on that. I personally would not like to put either one in my bathtub or my swimming pool. And no, I, have, I haven't tried that. And I have, <laughs> I have a tougher skin than these organisms that generate oxygen, the larval fish, uh, the baby tuna, and those other creatures that have to, have no choice, they swim through it. I am aware that the laboratory tests have been conducted on the dispersants have been conducted on laboratory cultures of organisms, not on creatures, especially not those in the deep sea at 5,000 feet or 4,000 feet or 1,000 feet or even at 100 feet. And we were conducting an experiment on the ocean itself. What happened to the precautionary principle of the use of some of these materials? It seems to me unwise at the very best. And personally, I would like to see a halt to the use of those dispersants. They're actually causing exactly what they're supposed to cause, the dispersing of the oil, when what we really should be trying to do is gathering it up and keeping it together so you can get at it, get rid of it, get it out of the ocean, instead of making it available to more and more of the small creatures that are there that actually make the ocean a living system. If you have uh, questions, uh, now is the time to get those to us. Uh, 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 go um, email us at questions with an S, questions at kedt.org. Uh, right now we have a question from our audience. Please go ahead. State your name and your question, please. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Richard, and this is directed to Dr. Earl. I appreciate your analogy of the two by four that uh, we've been whacked with, but there's another two by four that, we, that perhaps needs to be brought into this formula as we look at the long range, uh, as we seek answers to this challenge as we seek a long-term restoration for the Gulf of Mexico, and that's the hypoxic zone. That's the other two by four that we have struggled for years to bring to the national attention, and that includes a, a significant number of states, uh, 31, a significant number of Americans in the, between the Appalachians and the, Rio, and the Rocky Mountains. So perhaps this is a time and an opportunity to bring out another two by four uh, into the long-term restoration of the Gulf. Really good point. The ocean globally, but especially our beloved Gulf of Mexico, is an already stressed system. We've seen in the last 50 years a decline of ocean wildlife. The major fish species that are taken commercially decline by on the order of 90 percent. 
some, like the white tip shark <coughs> in the Gulf of Mexico, before the spill was thought to be 99% gone. The bluefin tuna that is so beloved by those who munch on sushi and sashimi and all the rest are, uh, well, this is one of two places in the Atlantic where they spawn. They were already seriously in trouble. And right in the pathway of where this oil has, has swept is where the tuna spawned this year. So this looks like a major setback. Barbara Block, who's an expert on tunas and a number of other large ocean creatures, is uh, trying to evaluate right now what the impact on this year's crop of young tuna might be. So we've got a stressed system already with so-called dead zone that has been generated over the last few decades through upstream sources of excess nitrates, phosphates, whatever it is that we throw in the, <coughs> the fields and farms that flow down into the Mississippi and other rivers and into the Gulf, combined now with the massive methane uh, that is filling parts of the Gulf and the oil and the dispersants. You know, we just need to have time out. Let's give the ocean a break and realize that we really benefit with our economy, our health, our security, but most importantly, our lives are dependent on the services that the ocean provides. The Gulf of Mexico is the ninth largest body of water on Earth, and it's in trouble. That translates to trouble for every breath you take, every drop of water you drink, for the carbon cycle, for the nitrogen cycle, for all those basic services at the ocean. And the Gulf of Mexico is a significant part of that. But they deliver for free, and so we haven't been accounting for them properly. Thank you. That's an excellent, excellent response. Uh, the questions are really coming in now, and that, that's great. I'm going to try to spread them around a little bit uh, and try to get to all of them. Uh, there is a question for Dr. Tunnel, since he's been kind of quiet on the end here on this type of area for right now. And it's a, the next stock related one. Is one is uh, there had of course the report of the stock oil. There was some question about what happened to all that oil. Where did where did it go? Uh, and also uh, you were uh, just down just just there looking sharp for something. Could you tell us kind of what your view on, on that question is? Sure. Uh, it's uh, perplexing to know what happened to all that oil. Uh, my colleagues in Mexico uh, simply made that statement. Uh, they thought that when the Eastock spill blew that it was going to be the end of the southern Gulf of Mexico. And yet two years after, as one uh, scientist, Luis Soto from UNAM, the main Mexico City National University, stated that two years after the spill, the shrimp catch in Campeche was the same as it was the year before the spill and they could hardly find where the oil was. And so this gets back to my statement about not having the comprehensive research to see uh, what happened to all the spill as well as what happened to all the organisms. Uh, I was just in Veracruz the last couple of days. On Wednesday, we went out to see if we could find the oil that I've been tracking since 79. And in about five minutes, I was able to find the tar mat in the lagoon of Medio Reef. It uh, shrunk in size. It was smaller in size and in thickness, uh, but it was still there. It looked uh, like a rock within the lagoon, but if you poked it with a knife or something, you could stick it into it and break it apart. And if you actually stood up out of the water from our snorkeling and broke it open, you could still smell the petroleum very strong in, inside of it. Yet it seemed to be kind of what we would call a halo effect, that right around it may have been an effect to the organism, but adjacent to it, uh, other things were growing and seeming to do fine, even growing on top of it or algae and some other things. And so it's pretty perplexing to see uh, what we did see and find at the East Coast Bowl. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tunnel. I'll, I'll use this uh, just, uh, before we go to the next question. If you'll be ready, we're going to ask our audience here has a question. Uh, uh, Dr. Tunnel's uh, trip uh, down uh, to Mexico was a preliminary one. Uh, HRI plans to put together an expedition uh, in middle of July to revisit all of his old sampling sites to, to uh, look at what the impact of Big Stock was 30 years ago with the idea of looking forward uh, and trying to and putting together a, our second Gulf Summit, which we're trying, we are going to organize for December of this year. Uh, the title of that summit will be uh, Beyond the Horizon, uh, uh, Thinking Deeper About the Gulf of Mexico. And the idea is to look at what our Gulf of Mexico will look like in 15, 
30 years from now, and what do we need to do to, do to make sure that we recover from, from this bill? We have a question now uh, from the audience, so please just state your name and your question. Okay, hi, my name is Pauline Forbes, and my question is this. Um, President Obama has said that after this oil spill has been taken care of, it seems his commitment is going to be to help put some attention on cleaning up and, and reclaiming some of the um, problems that have occurred in the Gulf. And so my question is, do you have any guidance for what we as the public can do to write to Congress and, and ask for specific things that would be very specific to our Gulf of Mexico and that we could maybe bring some pressure to bear on them to actually, you know, take action on some of those things. Just to, just to give you a preliminary answer, that of course, we as academics here at part of the university, we don't lobby con Congress or anyone else, but we do educate. Yeah. And so in, in a way of educating you, as you've asked, so I can do, I, I think it's an excellent question. And, and uh, I would tell you that uh, for many years, for those of us, uh, and Dr. Tunnel in particular, who's been here uh, in this water almost longer than me, or almost, I'm not gonna, neither one of us will admit however it's been in the water longer, uh, the Gulf of Mexico has long been considered the forgotten coast. When you look at the amount of uh, dollars that have gone to restoration uh, activities in Chesapeake Bay, millions and millions of dollars. President Obama said, uh, talked about the Great Lakes and, and putting up some $60 billion, 40 to $60 billion, something like that, for restoration work there. The Gulf of Mexico right now gets on equivalent level something uh, like 6 to $8 million a year, uh, and that's just started recently. So. Uh, the good side, of, I guess, if the good side of this bill is it's finally brought the attention to the Gulf of Mexico. The, we need to replumb the Gulf of Mexico. Dr. Earl talked about the Mississippi River and the, the fact that we're losing wetlands there uh, at 25 square miles a year during this meeting. Uh, that we're during this hour here, we will probably lose the equivalent of two to three football fields of wetlands just to subsidence. Not even speaking about the oil spill. So putting money there, the Everglades. Doing those things to bring the attention uh, to the Gulf of Mexico is necessary. So, so that needs to happen. We have uh, governing bodies in place. The Gulf Alliance is a state-directed uh, organization of the five Gulf states that have uh, working teams that are looking at addressing problems like the dead zones and nutrient over-enrichment. They need the funds to put those plans into place. So there's mechanisms there, but it will take the political will of people like yourself and others to say, okay, it's enough. Let's do this. And I think that's it. So we should probably get in touch like with the Gulf Alliance and... The, the question is who should get in touch with? I would tell you to look on the website for the Gulf Alliance. That will give you some guidance there. And so I'm going to have the panel. I, I'm, I did my soapbox, in my educational soapbox, but I know the panel, both any of them have a question. So I'll start with Dr. Dr. Tunnel and go to Dr. Earl. Uh, I, from experience of other fields, I would just say that the target of your question is that there's a timeline that we can do this because once a spill is over with, uh, again, like the research I mentioned earlier, I noticed in our National Field Training School here on campus that we'll fill the classes for two years, maybe three years after a major spill, and then everybody tapers off of that until we come up to another one. So we need to act quickly in the next year or so to get these things done. Dr. Earl. One thing, a prescription to underwrite the health of the ocean with benefits back to everybody is to take care of the ocean with policies that are really directed at, at doing what we can while we can right now to identify the critical areas and embrace them with real protection. Seagrass beds, coral reefs, to explore, identify critical areas in the deep sea, spawning sites that we know about and find out where the others are for creatures that are critical to the nature of the Gulf itself. Certainly the bluefin tuna. But what about the other creatures? The Gulf is hosts a population of sperm whales, for heaven's sakes. Most people have, have not been aware of this as a home for sperm whales or for dozens of other kinds of marine mammals. And the sharks, we need to protect all sharks. They're critical to the health of the ocean. Only about 10% remain. That's just not acceptable, speaking for the ocean. We need to have large extensions of real protection. Marine sanctuaries do not really provide sanctity for the species that are there presently. 
so many places where even the fish are safe. This should not be uh, something that takes away from anybody. It gives back to the ocean that has always given back to us. But we've reached the point of breaking the back of the ocean with the decline of ocean wildlife with such drastic slides in the last few decades. The best way to restore the health of the ocean is to have large marine protected areas. There can't be fishermen, there can't be shrimpers, unless you have fish and shrimp. And that means protecting the source. So it's not taking away from those who extract from the sea, it's actually protecting what it takes to keep their livelihoods alive. And so that's number one on my big list. Let's <coughs> identify in the Gulf of Mexico places that we should embrace and fully protect and every person can get behind that concept and let your voice be heard. Many around, uh, around the country, uh, and unfortunately those who should know better, think really the Gulf of Mexico is this industrial sea with only oil and gas and nothing else. And unfortunately this bill has, has not helped to correct that. But as Dr. Earl talked about, we have, for example, a resident population of some 1,700 sperm whales that never leave the Gulf of Mexico, that every day move up and down the water column and contest with giant squid, which also exist in the Gulf of Mexico. And so it's, it's a marvelous biodiversity that, 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 we, that we have here. Uh, a question now, please. Yes, I'm Richard Watson. I'm a coastal geologist. One thing that hasn't been mentioned is hurricanes. I'll get to that in just a second. But I've also crossed the Gulf on yachts and commercial fishing vessels many times over 30 years, uh, up till about 15 years ago. And I saw a, an incredible decrease in the number of flying fish out there over that time span. And they're not fish commercial. Uh, <clears throat> A few people have mentioned hurricanes. It is hurricane season. I think the initial thing is it's going to chase all the responders out there and the people that are collecting the oil and the big equipment is going to have to leave. But then what's going to happen? It strikes me that there's two possibilities. It could disperse the oil far and wide to where it dilutes it and maybe even put it all up on shore up high where it might do less damage. What are your opinions about the effect of a hurricane? Is it going to be worse? Is it going to be better? or no clue. Uh, response, uh, Dr. Tunnel raised his hand there, please. Yeah, Richard, I've uh, been telling people it, that there's kind of a good side and a bad side. Uh, the bad side is what you alluded to. If the oil along the outer margin of the Mississippi Delta is along all the marshes that are there, and it just stays in an outer band, that's one thing. But if a hurricane comes, or a tropical storm, or the storm surge, it will lift it then and spread it across the Delta marshes. And so that's a bad thing. The good side is that it agitates the water and goes through the physical breakdown then and helps in that process of physical degradation and also spawning more of the chemical and biological degradation. So it's kind of a good side and bad side. Yeah, they, and it depends on where that hurricane comes ashore. If, uh, if the hurricane, for example, pass, passes to the west of that slick, uh, it will likely drive uh, that all into the coast, as Dr. Tunnel was talking about. If it goes to the other side, it could drive it offshore. So as with anything with hurricanes, there, there, there are good and, good and bad sides of that. Uh, I'm going to take a step. We're, we're, getting, we, we're having a great question. We've got a lot of questions here. There was one that came in over the Internet, and I saw uh, my chair of, of marine policy and law, and so I used the prerogative of being a moderator. I just grabbed him out of the audience uh, so that I want to be sure to answer this question. So it's Dr. Richard McLaughlin. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just a couple of minutes to answer, but there was a question, and, and why don't you go ahead and answer this question that came in. Let me just read that question to you. Which basically um, was regarding the spill liability claim. Does the U.S. have a treaty uh, or agreement with Mexico or Cuba regarding joining together to, to bring a claim against uh, British Petroleum, and, and how would they do this? So do you want to quickly answer that one? Yes, those, those of you that heard me last week on this panel know that I can't answer this in two minutes, but I'll <laughs> definitely try. Uh, I'll have to. Um, the answer, the quick answer is no. We do not have any uh, uh, agreements um, with Mexico or Cuba uh, in order for them to make any claims against BP uh, in case this oil spill does wash up on their shores. Now, we do actually have a, a statute, the uh, Oil Pollution Act, which would allow for that if Cuba and Mexico had uh, statutes, domestic statutes of their own that were similar to ours. In other words, that's called reciprocity. But they do not have those right now. Um, now, having said that, the one thing that I can um, uh, relate is that 
This and everything else I said really last week when I was on the panel uh, has changed dramatically as a result of the, of the decision that was made two days ago to create a $200 billion escrow account. No one knows how that's going to be handled. Uh, my assumption is that it will be reserved for uh, American claimants and that if you are injured in Mexico or Cuba that you would not be able to make claims under that escrow account. But no one really knows at this point. So bottom line is that if Mexico or Cuba want to be compensated for any damages caused by this spill, they're likely going to have to have their governments negotiate with uh, the British government and with BP or to bring uh, lawsuits just like anyone else in a court of law uh, where they have jurisdiction over BP. So he was able to do that in two minutes, <laughs> which, I, which I appreciate. Our, our next question from our audience, please state your name and your question. I'm Jake Warren, and uh, I have a question as to who is trying to fix this and what they're doing to fix it, because to me it seems like we should be the ones just getting in there and solving this problem ourselves, and we can figure out who's to blame after it's all solved. Uh, res response to that? I'll, as you're thinking about it, I will give you that. I think that's actually the, kind of the crux of the matter is, is that uh, this is such a specialized uh, area working at 5,000 feet of depth in the Gulf of Mexico where the pressure is something like 2,000 pounds per square inch, the temperature is something like your refrigerator or colder. Uh, the, only, the only organizations uh, that have the capability of doing that are the oil and gas companies that drill here. So that they have the technology and Dr. Earl uh, responded at this point we've uh, let our our scientific capabilities fall back so far that we can't even go to the bottom uh, of the ocean uh, readily here so so it's a it's a frustrating problem but there's not an easy answer to that uh, any other additional response from the from the panel yeah I would uh, uh, agree with Larry's assessment there uh, I had a, a question over a radio program recently and the caller wanted to know why didn't the U.S. government step in and take over and fix this problem? Uh, we wouldn't have the federal government to go rebuild a bridge if a bridge fell down. They don't have that capability to do that. The oil and gas companies are the ones that have the capability to do it. I have a, a question for uh, Dr. Nipper. Uh, well, I'll obviously, anyone can, but this one looked like it was obvious to her. Uh, what organisms and life stages are most vulnerable to the effects of oil and seawater? Okay, um, smaller organisms tend to be. Uh, and just be close to the mic so they can hear you. Okay. Okay. Check, check. Yeah. Okay. Smaller organisms tend to be more sensitive. They have a larger surface for volume of the animal, so that surface will allow more oil to. Uh, reach their bodies and cause attacks. The younger lifestyles of <coughs> organisms also tend to be more vulnerable. Uh, in addition to that, as I mentioned in my yeah, small initial talk, organisms that live associated with the water surface, particularly eggs of a variety of species, um, are very sensitive and tend to be very affected by the oil slip. Very good, thank you. Uh, question from the audience, please, Janine, I think. Go ahead, please. Um, my name is Jane Bradley, and hopefully this doesn't happen, but if the oil keeps spreading in the Gulf, like, until July 1st, uh, how much damage would it cause? And, like, how far would it get? So the question is, is if the oil continues to, to uh, spread. spread out, what, what do you think the extent of the damage could be? Mm -hmm. Broad question, okay. Anyone want to want to take a, take a shot at that? Uh, at the, well. Yeah, well, I can yeah, imagine Dr. O would want to do it. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a question that you know, even a month or two months or three months or six months or a year from now, we still won't really be able to fully answer that question because for one reason we're not out there right now assessing what's actually happening. We don't have as well the capacity to really track the oil as it's going through its, its journey. It's frustrating not to be able to do that. We can't even, at this stage, have a publicly available view of, of the full area around. We have this little snapshot of what's happening at the wellhead. But where's the surrounding area view that will give us insight into what, what the seafloor is like, or what, what happened to that rig that collapsed? Uh, we're being, one of the problems is transparency with information that it does exist somewhere. Another is access so that we can independently or with, with a relative of the respective agencies that are engaged have follow-on 
studies. I mean, people are gearing up to look right now, but to get a full assessment, well, we may never really know. It will, if, if the oil continues to spill, according to the models and the project, projections that have been made already, oil will slip around the tip of Florida, up the East Coast, across via the Gulf Stream to the UK. Imagine that. <laughs> and we have uh, another question from the audience. I'm Nina Smith, and I live here out on the island. I still have sand on my feet. I came straight from the beach. We have tar balls washing up out there. It started about four days ago, and it was really flat and looked like tar paper. Now they're thick and smushy, like regular tar balls. And now there's also things coming in that look like tar, but they're hard as rocks. And I was wondering if that was maybe with the dispersion getting in there or something, and if anybody here has a plan to save our beaches. Well, that's, uh, that's news to me. I haven't, haven't heard that. It's a good, good question, so it certainly ought to be looked at. I would tell you that, uh, it's, it's, uh, well, that we need to be looking at it. I just don't know. I don't imagine, Wes, this is your, your area. Do you have a, a comment? Yeah, I, I wouldn't suspect that it, from the present spill, um, we have both seepages and spills that go on, unfortunately, all the time. They're usually attended to, but there's not any indication that, that the current spill has brought the oil over here. Um, we can link back to the present question for the larger knowledge of the group. You may have noticed uh, in the last few days that the loop current has actually split off into this large eddy. That's an anticyclonic eddy that's spinning and if that continues in the process what it normally does, it will start moving to the west and it does have the opportunity then to bring things over. It takes several months for it to come across the Gulf of Mexico. And it could be not only surface but uh, deeper water. We would just have to have that, you know, check the city. I don't think it's a permanent spill. One, one of the um, outcomes of, of our meetings, and I appreciate it. If you have a follow-up question, you can certainly come, come and ask. Uh, is that um, uh, because of our panel uh, sessions, uh, uh, Dr. Neal, uh, Judge Neal, not Dr. Neal, Judge, Judge Neal, uh, has uh, been working to put together a, uh, a oil spill summit for Nueces County uh, to bring all of the uh, responders and people together to, to talk about this very topic. How, how would, if we do get some impact from this, this bill, how would we respond? How do we get everyone together right now and ahead of time? And also, if we're looking forward, I believe that summit is going to be held uh, July 9th. So uh, local um, uh, experts and local folks with responsibility are already looking at that, that question. They'll be interested to hear what you said. You had a follow-up question very quick. Or just um, a few minutes. That was my first thought, too. It was just one of our regular oil spills. But this is from Texas Parks and Wildlife. It says, yesterday's collection of oil debris, which made landfall on South Beach, included a 55-gallon BP oil drum that contained several gallons of liquid. And it goes on to say it was placed in hazmat, 100 of paper-thin tar, tar balls observed by the Coast Guard during overflight surveillance operations have washed ashore in the big shell area of South Beach, and it goes on. We'll, we'll stand by and we'll be uh, concerned uh, if that's already there and got to us. So thank you for that. So we learned something today. All of us did. So you can go back to the beach and get the sand in your toes and tell us what you find and, and keep the tar off your feet. Uh, another question, uh, like, like I think we have, we have time for that. Please go ahead, state your name and your question. Speak um, closer to the mic, please. I'm Adalberto Morion. Um, my question is, uh, you guys mentioned before that the oil is going to flow through Florida and go up the coast. What's going to happen to places like Florida who might not be able to recover with all the tourism and the money to get through tourism and stuff like that? And I know, like, if it's going to go up our east, our east coast, what's going to happen to like, places like, I guess, Philadelphia and stuff like that, where they actually need, like, their bay to, to flourish in their economy? The, uh, the question is, uh, has to do with the oil spill, and I think we're going to, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, and, and a long one, and I think that's something that, that we're going to have to address. Uh, we'll address it in our next panel. We're running short of time here. I wanted to just uh, to wrap up. Thank you for the question. I'm sorry we couldn't uh, answer, but we will get to you all off the air. Uh, I really want to thank our panel uh, of experts for being here. Some wonderful responses to questions. This is such a huge uh, issue that we're all all facing, and and the best thing that we can have as citizens and those concerned about the Gulf of Mexico is is good information, and that's that's what our objective here is to get that information out uh, out to you uh, and so you can understand what's going on. Don't hesitate, uh, even in between these panels, and we have one more panel scheduled for next Friday, to get your questions to us. Uh, and we will uh, be, make sure they are addressed. 
Again, I want to thank KDT for their support, the university for its support of bringing this uh, opportunity to our community and allowing us to bring experts together to address one of the great environmental uh, disasters of our time and hopefully the last one like this that we will ever see. Thank you very much.